So here it is. This is the lesson that you have been waiting for for like 12, 13, 14 years. The fundamental theorem of algebra. This is what it's all been leading to. So uh, you can see there's a gargantuan amount of stuff in this lesson. Four objectives. First one, apply this thing called the fundamental theorem of algebra and its corollary. Okay, so we've pretty much been leading up to this and, and we've been hinting at it and you probably already have a pretty good feel for what the fundamental theorem of algebra is, but maybe you don't even know what it is yet. Okay, so the word fundamental means that it's, it's integral, it forms the, the foundation of. Okay, and then the, you, you probably remember theorem from geometry. The theorem is a statement that you have to prove. So someone's come up with some sort of conjecture and they think it's true, and then in mathematics you got to prove it using deductive reasoning. Okay, corollary is, think of it like a baby theorem. So once you have the actual theorem, this is a consequence of it, and then it's very easy to prove afterwards. Okay, number two, whenever I go to graph these things, what does, what does the graph look like, a polynomial graph around its zeros? And, and you'll see that there's basically two cases there. It's pretty easy. Number three, we have been solving these uh, these uh, polynomial functions, and we're getting we're getting sometimes some conjugates. So we've got a couple of conjugate theorems to talk about, and then the last one, Descartes. Descartes was a French philosopher and mathematician, and he came up with some rules. Apply or use Descartes' rule of signs to determine positive or negative real solutions. It's pretty handy. It'll be another one of those shortcuts that we can use to kind of shrink down our list of possibilities whenever we go to uh, find the zeros of a polynomial function. Okay? So, first objective is the fundamental theorem of algebra. Being able to apply it and its corollary. So in the picture there, is a sketch of this mathematician named Gauss. And uh, Gauss is pretty famous for looking very dramatic, as you can see in that picture. And, um, and he was a pretty smart guy. So you can see the dates there, 1777, 1855. So he's been dead for a bit. So his picture is on here because he is the one, he's the first one to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. So let's lead up to that. Starting with this. How many solutions does the equation, and I can see that I have a, a quartic equation. It has a degree of four. So from experience we know, or we should know, that there should be four solutions here. Okay, that's an exclamation point. How many zeros does this function have? So f of x equals x cubed, blah, 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 blah. This one's a cubic. How many solutions should I expect here? There's three. Three of them. Okay, so far so good. Okay, let's look at some graphs. Let's look at equations and the graphs that goes with it. Okay, so I've got a cubic, and you can see this little graph. It has disco dancer, um, in behavior there, and I can see the exact zeros from this little graph. I've got negative 5, I've got 1, and I've got positive 5. So let's just go ahead and factor that thing out. Um, I'm going to do something a little unconventional here. I'm going to factor this one by grouping, just because I can. They're not always going to factor by grouping, but this one does. So from the first set of terms, I can pull out x squared. And then in parentheses, I'll have x minus 1 left over. Okay, from the second set of parentheses, I can pull out a 25. I'm going to make it negative, so it matches up with the first set of parentheses. So minus 25, and then x minus 1. They share a common factor, x minus 1. And then what's left over is x squared minus 25. Yes? Okay. So the second set of parentheses, that's the difference of two squares. So x minus 1, x minus 5, and x plus 5. 
Okay, so I can see that I have a degree of 3. I can see from the graph and from the uh, factored equation that I have three zeros and three x-intercepts. So here's a question for you. Are zeros always the same thing as x-intercepts? And the answer is not always. Um, we'll see that in the course of this lesson. When is a zero not an x-intercept? When that sucker is imaginary. Okay, so let's look at a follow-up one. So um, this one's still cubic, still has a disco dancer um, in behavior, but whenever I look at my x-intercepts, I only have one, two of them. Okay, but uh, I have a degree of three here. Let's, let's see what's going on. Okay, so notice that I could just divide out the uh, negative five. Let's do that synthetically. One, one, three, negative nine, and five. Bring down the one, negative five, negative two, plus a ten, one, negative five, zero. Okay, so what's left over is the quadratic x squared minus two x plus one. Anybody recognize what that is? That is a perfect square trinomial x minus one squared. So this whole thing factors as x minus 1 squared times x plus 5. Okay. So from this first one I get x is equal to 1. From the last one I get x is equal to negative 5. It looks like I only have two zeros there. But really I have three because the first one, x minus 1 squared, is like I have x equals 1 twice. This is called multiplicity. It occurs twice. And, and you may remember whenever we were doing quadratics and graphing quadratics and talking about those, that if it was a perfect square trinomial, there was only one solution. And that solution happened when the vertex of it was exactly on the x-axis. And that's what's going to happen. So that's, that's one of the things that's going to go together with this little theorem. So. So let's look at a few more graphs. So this is exactly what I was talking about just a second ago. This is, this is what we've done in the, the past couple of units. So if I had a second degree equation, it's quadratic, I should expect to have two zeros. So look at the first one. Those two zeros correspond to the two x-intercepts. Okay, if I look in the middle, it looks like I only have one x-intercept. You still have two zeros, it's just repeated twice. That's exactly like this previous one right here. Okay, and the last one, it's not touching the x-axis at all, so it looks like I have none, but I do have two imaginary ones. If I have imaginary ones, do not touch the x-axis. So here's some pictures of third degree ones. So the basic case. I've got three zeros. Each one of them is an x-intercept. In the second picture, it looks like I only have two, but right there, that one's repeated two times. So two plus one gives me my three total. In this last picture, it looks like I only have one. Where are the other two? The other two are imaginary, so it doesn't actually dip down far enough to touch the x-axis. All right, so here's a whole bunch of possibilities for fourth degree. On the fourth degree, the straightforward case, one, two, three, Four x-intercepts, all the zeros are x-intercepts. The middle one, one, two, three. I only have three, but this one is repeated times two. Next one, one, two. I only have two, what are you talking about? That's because this one is repeated twice, and this one's repeated twice. All right? Um, one, two, I'm supposed to have four. This one is repeated once, but this next one's repeated three times. If I look at the next one, looks like I only have one right here at two. Guess how many times that one's repeated? Four times. Wow. And then, on the last one, it doesn't touch the x-axis at all. These are all imaginary. So here we go. Um, how many zeros does a quintic polynomial have? Remember, a quintic means it has a degree of 5. So degree equals 5. So I should expect to have um, 5 zeros. Follow-up question. How many x-intercepts does a quintic polynomial have? Well, does it have to have 5? No, because some of them could be repeated, or maybe some of them are imaginary. So it's up to 5. Right? And then the last one, are why aren't these answers the same? And this is what we were just looking at in some of those pictures. Sometimes they repeat. And when they repeat, um, so, sometimes they just kind of dip down to the x-axis, or maybe they pass through and jag a little bit. Or they're not going to touch the x-axis at all. 
if those zeros are imaginary. So here's that guy again, Carl Friedrich Gauss. And uh, when he was a little kid, I mean, he was really, really smart in mathematics, even as a little kid, way smarter than any of us. Um, you can see child prodigy there. And it says he could add up the numbers 1 to 100 really fast, even as a kid. So um, when he was 10 years old, well, there's a legendary story about them. I'll, I'll let you look at it in the optional video that should be posted right down below. It's very, very interesting. Okay, so here is, finally, finally, the fundamental theorem of algebra. Please, please sit tight, pay attention. Here we go. If f of x is a polynomial function of degree n, so in other words, it has fifth degree, fourth degree, whatever, where n is positive, of course n is positive, it's a polynomial degree, right? Then f of x has, you ready for it? At least one zero in the set of complex numbers. Hmm. Just at, at least one, that's it? That's, that's all it says? That's all it says. Okay. Well, so all this is saying, basically, you have at least one complex solution. That's what this is saying. Any nth degree polynomial has at least one complex solution. And, well, since real numbers, every single real number is a complex number, it could be a real, a real solution. So remember, complex goes like this, a plus bi. Real ones are whenever b is equal to zero. Doesn't seem very useful. Hi, Ro. You can come on in. So, just push it, push it. There you go, baby. Uh, first proven by Gauss. After a whole bunch of people tried to prove it, but they couldn't prove it. So he's the first one to come around. It's like, uh, I'm a little bit smarter than you guys. Here's how you prove this. Um, the only thing is, is that it doesn't seem very useful because all you're saying that you have at least one solution. This is what's called an existence theorem. All it tells you is that something exists. It doesn't tell you how to get it. It doesn't even tell you how many there are, just at least one. So here is somewhat more useful a corollary. So here's the fundamental theorem of algebra corollary. You alright? It's very cute. So if f of x is a polynomial function of degree n, so third degree, fourth degree, whatever, then f of x has exactly n solutions. So fifth degree has five solutions. Okay, that's, that's what we've been talking about. Provided that each solution that's repeated k times counts as k solutions. So if it repeats twice, it counts as two solutions, right? All right, now that's a little bit more useful. I'm Daddy. You remember. That's probably back in your bedroom. We'll go get it in a second. So what this means is nth degree polynomial has exactly n solutions. Fifth degree has five. Fourth degree has four. That's what it means. Now this whole thing with repeated roots, if it repeats k times, it's called a repeated root with multiplicity of k. So there's a new vocabulary word. Multiplicity just means it occurs more than once, however many times it's raised to that power. So here it is all summarized, fun theorem light. Consequent of the fundamental theorem of algebra and its corollary is, first of all, whatever the degree of the polynomial is, that's how many zeros or solutions you have. Okay, second part is, if it repeats k times, then it has a repeated solution or multiplicity of k. Let's look at the equation. This will wrap it all up here. Look at the equation. I got y equals x squared times x minus 3, x plus 5 cubed. I'm daddy. Okay, just a minute. So, let's first look at what the degree of this equation is. And I can get the degree of this equation if I just distribute this out. I'm not going to multiply it out, but just thinking about it, just multiply all these x's together. So this one is an x squared. From the other one, it's times x. And from the last one, if you cube this all out, that'll be times an x cubed. 
So just multiply all these together by adding up the exponents. There's a 1 there, so that is x to the 6th. So how many solutions should I expect to get? 6. It's a sextic polynomial. All right, so look at the first one. It's just x squared. What's your 0? It's 0. But how many times does it repeat? Twice. x equals 0 and x equals 0. The middle one, x equals 3, it just is raised to an understood 1, so it just repeats once. And then the last one, x plus 5, the solution is x equals negative 5, and since it's raised to the third power, it occurs three times. So if I count them all up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, there's our six solutions. The first one has a multiplicity of 2, the 0 does. The 3 has a multiplicity of 1, and the, the negative 5 has a multiplicity of 3. Okay, now what we're going to look at in the, next, in the next objective is what does a graph look like around each one of those zeros?